G'day, my name is Brendan. It's great to be here, my first kernel recipes. And my talk is on performance analysis with BPF. And I'm going to start with a demo straight away. So I'm going to create a workload that is, I like to do something different each time. I'm going to run top. And I've told it to have a refresh rate of once per second. And I'm going to dig into top to see how it works. In fact, I only just started doing this, so I'm not sure myself how the kernel internals operate. What I can do is I can guess that it's going to call functions including proc so that it can read the proc status that it's listing out per process. I can trace all functions that contain the letters proc and then control C and immediately tells me that it's called process measurement 1380 times, kick process 1326 times. I don't know what many of these are, but since the kernel has thousands and thousands of functions, I've just reduced the operating table to only the couple of dozen that are actually firing for my top workload. And so that makes understanding this much easier. I just now need to read the source for these. I can pick on some of these. So let me pick on, say, proc single show. Sounds good. So I can just trace that. I can, didn't fire. I can do func count minus i1, and it will print it out once per second for proc single show. So now I've created my own little tool that gives me the rate of a kernel function, which might be interesting for understanding things. If I actually have a look in proc, I have 109, fun uh, 109 processes in there. And to, if I multiply that by 3, I get to 327, and we're measuring 327. So it sounds like I've got, I'm doing a proc single show three times for each process. So that's pretty good. What else can I do? I can take proc single show, and I can look at its latency. And so I can say, this tool only show them if they're slower than one microsecond or 10 microseconds. It's filtering it out. I'm on a single CPU system, so it's actually getting some pretty high latency here because I'm getting some interrupts that are bumping it down. Well, that's pretty good. I can also look at stack backtraces to see how I got to proc single show. So let me do probe that. So there it is firing. I can add a minus s. That's not very interesting. So it's doing sysread, vfs read, vfs read into proc single show. I can dig into the arguments if I know where they are. percent DI for the, come on, x86, 64. So there's the first argument as hex with some hex string. If I look at this, who uses Cscope for source code browsing? Oh, a few people, a few people, it's good. So proc single show, the first argument is a seek file and then avoid star. So the first thing I'm looking at is a, a seek file, okay. So I'm getting more information on this. I can also look at the return value. I can trace that. I can also dig, slot, dig down into, so we saw it actually had some decent latency. Let's scroll off. So we're getting up to 10 microseconds. I can find out what it's doing by walking the graph of what's calling. Wow, it's calling a lot of stuff. Although it is actually being run 327 times a second. I can limit this down. Maybe I only want to go down three levels deep. Okay, that's still a lot of stuff. Go down two levels deep. All right. Proc single show calls get pid task and proc pid status. So now I know a lot more about this kernel function. I've, I've started with my top workload. I've found out that it's calling this proc single show. I found a stack backtrace. I found out what it's calling. I found out its latency. And I've started to dig into arguments. Does this seem familiar? Does this seem awesome? to do this sort of kernel observability. On the fly, I can do this on production. It's pretty awesome, except this is ftrace. I'm just demonstrating what Stephen Rostat covered earlier. So it's important when we look at tools like eBPF to understand what the kernel already does. Because I can show you a lot of eBPF stuff, and you'll say, wow, that's awesome. It's like, well, 
F-Trace already does this and has done this for years. So what makes eBPF awesome is the extra bits that we couldn't do before. So I'll show you something a little bit that was hard to do before. So I kind of stopped at, so this is actually a toolkit that I wrote a while ago. It's shell scripts that sit on top of F-Trace. They're really simple shell scripts. Stephen Rested did, did all the work. I'm just wrapping it. Now if I go back to my K-probe, I got as far as uh, percent DI, but there's gotta be a better way to dig into these arguments, this seek file, although I've picked a, a rotten example. So this time I'm now gonna switch to a wrapper for BPF. I'm going to do trace. I can say trace proc single show. And so that's just gonna do a per event dump. If I copy this, it will then let me dereference the arguments. Okay, that still works. I still get my kernel warning, which got fixed. And now I can do things like Okay, print out that. Oh, I'm using it. Okay, we're not quite at that tracing tool yet. I'll demonstrate something later. All right. Proc single show. So now I'm, I'm getting as far as I got with, with F trace. But it's operating on a seek file. I want to see the file name and I want to dig out stuff from it. So what I can do is it's got a. My finest definition. Oh, there you are. So it's got a struct file called file. So that's its member. Oh, come on, refresh. So I'm starting with M. That's, I just copied and pasted it. Now dereference file. Now it doesn't like it because that's actually not pulled in by default in the BCC includes. So I did want to show a little bit of a gritty, dirty example because this is, this is real life. So I'm actually, BCC by, by default, BCC is a front end under BPF that I'm using for this script. And by default, it will pull in a lot of things. So you've got task struct and file structs and lots of things. This one's a bit odd. So it's not being pulled in by default, but I can bring it in. So I can pull in. There we go. So now I'm actually digging out the file, the pointing to the file struct, and I've just had to include that. that. That's part of the Linux headers package. So far, so good. I can keep digging down until I get to something interesting like the actual name, which I did earlier. So, so if I run this one liner, I'm now instrumenting proc single show, and I'm digging out the the parent directory name and then the actual name of the file. So you can see how it's, it's getting called, like I said, three times for each process, I can see it's getting called for stats, statm, and status. And I'm having no trouble digging out kernel structs and doing dereferencing. It's a one-liner, it's pretty nasty, but it's, it is an awesome capability to be able to instrument, dig something out of the kernel that I find interesting and then print it out. This is not actually demonstrating BPF in a way. The bit that translates all of this is the front end BCC. And it goes and uses LVM and Clang. That could actually, we could actually wrap ftrace and get as far, of the, as far as this. So I could actually write an ftrace version of trace that did the same thing. And it just turned that long dereference. Because with, with ftrace, you've got this syntax. So if I go back to my K probe, I can dereference this at offset zero, and then keep dereferencing at offset eight, and so on. Has anyone done this stuff before? <laughs> this stuff gets pretty complicated fast, and like, oh look, I just dereference zero, so like, I mean, there's also no safety, so eventually it will fault if I get the wrong thing. I seem to be guessing the right thing all the time. Anyway, so that's pretty nasty. We could put a front end onto that and basically accomplish the same thing. So for something that eBPF can do is, let me try func latency. So now I'm doing a histogram of function latency for proc single show. And on the left is nanoseconds, and it's showing the distribution. It's using an eBPF map. This is stored in kernel, it's very efficient. The kernel to user level 
transfer is only the count column. So we're only passing an array of numbers down. And that's only when I hit Control-C. So to do this with ftrace previously, we would have to instrument the function entry and the function return, or we could use the, uh, what I'm using for func slower so I can actually see, uh, but that's average latency. Yeah, per, per event to turn it into a histogram is uh, much more complicated. So it would often involve dumping to user level and then uh, doing post-processing there. So with eBPF, I can make this much more efficient. Except recently with ftrace, there's the hist triggers, which can do, start to do some of the, these in-kernel histograms as well. With eBPF, it's about running custom programs when events fire for, so we can create our own observability tools. And now I'm going to get out of the ftrace directory and, and show some eBPF ones. Yeah, I've, got, I've ported some of my old tools like execsnoop, which are, ah, get out of this which just show functions that are firing, but I, could, I can actually implement this using lots of different kernel facilities. Things that are a bit more interesting is where I'm, same instrument in the ext4 file system, and I'm seeing if anything's slower than zero milliseconds. This is a virtual machine, so it's pretty fast. So now I can look at event by event as I'm operating on files. I don't need that. So I'm doing uh, ext, wow, that's really boring. Just give me a sync. So now I'm doing some histograms of ext4 operation latency very quickly. Again, this is some custom EB, EB programs where I'm doing a latency histogram, but I'm also using a custom key, which is the operation type. And so you can imagine, right, and this is using kernel dynamic tracing using k-probes to instrument the ext4 functions. And so you can imagine if you're doing kernel development and you'd like to understand latency and digging into arguments and pulling out members, you can start to do a lot of this in BCC, BPF. In fact, I've got a lot of these installed under user share BCC. So we've packaged this up so that it's easy for people to install these tools now. And there's a lot of things like cache, cache stat is one of my favorite ones or cache stat. That's just going to show me page cache, hits, misses. I've got tools for different file systems that I've written, uh, going into different languages, and uh, doing kernels. Uh, one of my favorite tools, favorite tools is run queue latency, so I can immediately see scheduler run queue latency. And so there's my time, of my task is blocked, waiting its turn on CPU. So I've been building up various tools so that people can use BPF very quickly, and these are supplemental to the existing Linux performance tools. You might want to use the tools, you might want to write your own tools, you might want to write a GUI that goes on top of the tools because you don't want to log into machines at all. So these are all possible with BPF. There's one other demo I should do before I go to the slides. This is bash readline, and I'm, and I'm using uprobes to instrument the bash shell, just to show that we can go into user level as well. So it's not just about kernel tracing. And some user level stuff that's interesting is being able to do, say, name resolution, so that you can analyze DNS problems. And you can instrument the name resolution library, so any consumer of that library, you, you're able to extract custom latency metrics. I work at Netflix. Stranger Things season two is coming out in October, which is really awesome. And it's one of my favorite shows. And in Stranger Things, there is a character, Eleven, who has superpowers. And as part of the narrative, you get to find out as she learns the superpowers and what she can do. I think with BPF, it's similar, because we have these superpowers now digging into the kernel. And it's exciting to find and learn what we can do with them. Some of the tools I demonstrated, I've drawn this diagram showing a generic kernel and where the tools instrument. So I already demonstrated some of these, like exec snoop and run queue latency. The three things I'd like to explain in the slides is so that you understand Linux tracing and what's happening with enhanced BPF for observability, how to use these tools, 
so they're pretty easy to use. And then areas for future development because you might be interested in working on it, contributing, and so on. I mentioned I work at Netflix. We run Ubuntu on the Amazon cloud for, for the cloud. When you log into Netflix and authenticate and browse titles, that's all coming from Amazon EC2 and Ubuntu Linux. When you hit play, that's coming from a FreeBSD CDN. And one thing I want to mention is BPF is awesome, and I, I did this one liner where I can instrument proc status show and pull out the D entry path name. A lot of people don't really want to do that. So for kernel engineers, that's, that's great that we can, you can start with tasks, tasks, struct, and dig out whatever you want on any event. But for a lot of people, they will just want to use the, end, the CLI tools or GUI tools, especially at Netflix where we have a model of creating self-service tools that people use. So a lot of people will actually use Netflix, BPF at Netflix, because they go to one of the GUIs that I wrote and they click a button and they get a report. BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. It's this weird technology that's been in the kernel for a while for making TCP dump go faster. And if you ran TCP dump with minus D, it will print out the assembly that BPF uses. And so this is something that gets compiled for efficiency so that when you're doing packet filtering at a, a very high rates, the kernel isn't spending too many CPU cycles on it. The most interesting thing about BPF is it's a virtual machine in the kernel, virtual machine in the kernel, which means we can define user-level code and have the kernel execute it. And it's also sandboxed, so it's secure. So more recently, Alexei Storytoyov, originally at Plum Grid, is now at Facebook, and others began enhancing it to do extended operations to support software-defined networking. So you could create NATs and virtual routers and various things in BPF. So instead of just filtering packets, also manipulating packets, and then overriding the bytes in headers. Alexi was smart enough to realize that this could do more than just packets. If we instrument K probes and U probes, we could run programs on anything. And so we could come up with a really advanced tracer capabilities that was built into the kernel. How we're we using it for tracing, I've got a diagram to show where we can source things from trace points, K probes, and U probes, and also perf events, PMCs. They can, they can be attached to a BPF program. The is either per event data, which I'll sometimes use, but wherever possible, I'll use maps so that I can do an asynchronous copy of summary statistics. Actually, the per event data uses the perf event ring buffers, so that's asynchronous copied as well. It's all designed for efficiency and production use. So wherever possible, I want latency histograms so that all I'm passing from kernel to user is the count column and not every event. <clears throat> Maps is a data structure that was added to eBPF. It did not exist in normal EPF. And maps, one way to think of maps is a, an associative array. So you can put anything you want in them. And they can be very large. This is probably pretty obvious, but I still run into people that have the old mindset of event tracing, where let's do TCP dump, all the packets, and then post-process it, and we can figure out things like retransmits and first byte latency and all of that stuff, like how your TCP window size changes over the duration of the session. Well, where possible, we can now just instrument kernel functions directly. So we don't have to instrument every packet, dump it to the file system, dump it to disks, reread it using an analysis tool, because that involves a lot of overhead. And certainly in Netflix, when we have instances with 10 gigabit Ethernet, we're doing a lot of packets per second. And so dumping all the packets and then post-processing it is a lot of work. I'd much prefer put my finger on a kernel function, like TCP retransmit SKB, and say, just instrument that, and then print out the IP address instead of touching everything. There's been a lot of development of eBPF over the last few years, and I've marked this diagram with when support landed in the kernel. So by Linux 4.9, we had basically all the major features for an advanced observability tool. So Linux 4.9 added PMC access and also sampling. I'll put these slides online, so they'll be on SlideShare and you can get them as a PDF. <clears throat> 
hands up if you're on Linux 4.9 or newer. All right, so I've got a third of the people. So if you're not on 4.9, see people already on it, and they're not, their phones aren't ringing, they aren't getting paged to put out fires. So they're sitting here calm and relaxed, even though they're on 4.9. So it sounds like a good, good place to be, since you'll get all of this. I've also summarized the Linux tracing timeline, because there's been a lot to this over the years. Static traces have been around for a long time. Dynamic traces, there were prototype dynamic traces in the 1990s. Linux almost integrated D-probes, which had dynamic tracing, but that didn't get in. And so later since then, we've had F-trace, perf events, trace points, lots of enhancements, and most recently is the eBPF work and F-trace hist triggers. BCC is a front end on BPF. It may not be the only front end, but it's one front end that a lot of us are using. You'll find it on, and a lot of the tools I was demonstrating earlier came from BCC. The lead developer is Brendan Blanco, and he's now at VMware. BCC comes with lots of tracing tools, so you can use it. You can write the front end in Python, Lua, C++, just C. There's also a Golang front end, so it, you don't have to write things in raw BPF, which looks like this, and is one of the hardest languages. Actually, I guess it's the hardest language I've ever tried to code in because I've never had one of my e raw eBPF programs compile correctly. And it's, this, it's a custom assembly, so I can't go to Stack Overflow and say, well, I'm getting this weird assembly error message from, my, because no one's seen this before. This is new. Like, if I'm doing x86, 64 assembly, there's a lot of help online. But for this stuff, it's, uh, it's new. Fortunately, I don't need to write this stuff myself. I can write it in C. And so compilers, LVM and Clang, have been taught to take C code and then convert it into BPF bytecode. You can then load into the kernel. And then BCC takes us one step up further where, so this is a BCC program that fits on one side. They're pretty long, but this one actually fits on the left-hand side, you can see I've defined a C program, and on the right-hand side, I have the Python code that will print it out, that will load it into the kernel and then print out. That's doing disk I.O. as a histogram, disk I.O. size, kilobytes. There is a new one being developed, and there's been a few. There's been, there was Shark, and then Ply, and there's a new one called BPF Trace. And BPF Trace is pretty promising in that it's a very high-level front end, similar to, say, dtrace or system tap. And there's an example of BPF trace where I can just run krep probe of sysread, do a power of two, quantize histogram of the return value. So done. It's still very much in development. And if you want to help out, that would be great. The status of all of these tracing tools, since there's so many, I've tried to summarize here. So on the... Y-axis, I've got how easy these are to use. And I said raw BPF was brutal. It's very difficult to use. And on the, the right is the scope and capability. How much can we instrument? I keep having to bump perf and ftrace to the right because they're getting more and more capabilities. It probably should be more over to the right still. And you can see where, say, the role of BPF trace is something that's very, very easy. I can do high-level one-liners. Uh, it does not... It's not completely developed yet, so there's still more work we need to do. Now, some CLI tools to go through them from BCC. I do have a slide in the slide deck to remind us that you don't start with, if you're doing performance analysis, you don't start with advanced tracing tools. This stuff is still useful, so I still run up dmessage and vmstat and mpstat because they do solve a lot of problems. And in BCC to your systems, Nowadays, it's getting quite easy. It used to be a long install process, but now it's available on package repositories. And it will put tools under user share BCC tools. In the slides, I have a checklist. Since BCC itself is so large, these are some of the tools that I would step through on a system if I didn't know where to start. So running exxnoop, which just prints out the processes that are running, is actually quite handy since quite often things are misconfigured. And in fact, I have this at Netflix where I've got an instance and I'm trying to micro-benchmark on it, but I have these weird perturbations 
And then just running exec snoop shows that there is a misconfigured Apache Tomcat service where it's running its, its boot script every five seconds and failing. Every five seconds, and then sleeps for five seconds. And five seconds later, it perturbs my micro benchmark. So just running exec snoop lets, lets me discover things like that. XD4 slower, and I've got versions of that for different file systems. Going down to the disk level, bio latency, bio snoop. I've written some TCP tools, although there's a lot more we, we can do. So being able to just instrument when you connect to a remote host and when you accept a connection from a remote host. At, oh, one of my favorite ones is TCP Life, which is not on the list. Maybe I should add it. With TCP Life, yeah, don't worry about that warning. That got fixed. If I log into my, my instance and then log out, TCP Life is printing out the just the top level details you'd like. So I've got the duration of the session and then the dotted quads port number. I also have the, the transmit and receive kilobytes and I'm doing all of this without touching send and receive. There's so many network, not to go on a rant, but there's so many network performance monitoring companies who want to take that and then visualize it for your data center. It's pretty useful, but the way they do it is they instrument send receive and they want to do it with kernel modules. I don't want you to touch send receive. I mean, Netflix on the the OCA appliances that we have, we're over 33% of the US internet traffic at night. Can you imagine touching send receive for 33% of the US internet traffic at night? It's, it's gonna cost a fortune in CPU cycles when I'm doing the same data without touching send receive. So I'm actually instrumenting just TCP set state. And so when I notice you go from the handshake is completed, I record a timestamp and when that finishes, when I see you go into last act and finished, I, I then know the duration, and all I've instrumented is TCP set state. I get the transmit and receive kilobytes out of the TCP stats struct, because Google and Facebook have been adding these statistics to them in, the, in the last few years. So all of this accomplished with just TCP set state, much lower frequency than doing send and receive. The overhead of all these tools is relative to the frequency of events. So that's why I don't, I don't want to touch send receive if I can avoid it, and I can avoid it. Just to show what that looks like is, it's pretty nasty, but it's not like, <laughs> it's not the worst program in the world, it's only 360 lines. So in the kernel, I am going and instrumenting TCP set state, and then figuring out when I should be recording the birth time, when it's synchronous so that I can record the process ID and command, when the, the correct thread is on CPU, and then digging out IPv4, go and dig out the source address and destination address and things like that. Yes, a question? I'll write the mic, yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, what the, uh, the extent of sandboxing, I mean, for example, um, you see, I see you not causing K time, not calling K time get NS using a specific BPF helper, but you do call uh, N2HS. So uh, to what extent do you have access to uh, calling kernel functions from a BPF or only inline headers? Uh, and to what extent can you do things like, I don't know, I'm trying to instrument a driver and I want to do an MMIO read to read a counter on a device. Can I do that? Okay, so you cannot call arbitrary kernel functions. You can only call the BPF actions that mostly Alexi have coded in. If it looks like I'm calling a kernel function, I'm not. So enter HS would be an inline yeah. macro, and so it expands into a bunch of instructions. So you can do things like a list next and stuff like that because they are in line. Right. But so, you compile list debug in and you can't anymore uh, because suddenly you have an out of line call in there. Um, yeah, okay. So, an so if, you had a, if you had a use case of like, I need to do this register read for this special device, we would have to add a new BPF action for that. Yeah. And Alexi's added a lot of BPF actions, and so there's gonna be cases where we need to extend it. The, yeah. uh, sort of correlate to that, because I sort of think of it also, also as a way potentially to debug how to track down bugs. Things where I know I have a condition that's gonna happen after three days of running. Uh, and I sort of have an idea of what's happening. I could in inject some uh, eBPF thing that's gonna monitor uh, 
the sanity of the state of something in a kernel uh, to help me track it down. Do you have any way of modifying the content of a kernel data structure? Or you can only read? So we can't modify kernel data structures yet. There's a few BPF actions for touching socket buffers so that we can change IP addresses as part of the, the original role of eppf, so software-defined networking. So if you want to do some weird networking things, you probably can because there are those functions. For arbitrary kernel memory, that function, last I looked, doesn't exist. Uh, recently, we did add a user-level copy out so that you can overwrite user-level memory. Okay. So you can't write, just take the pointer and the reference equals something. That's right. It won't compile. And even if it did compile into bytecode and you sent it to the kernel, the BPF verifier in the kernel would reject it. Thanks. So I just want to show some internals of actual doing BPF. Uh, these are all online. They're all on the GitHub iAvisor BCC repository. In the slides, I have some output for some of these tools, but I already demonstrated them. Exact Snoop is great for looking at process invocation. XT4 Slower is great for looking at slow I.O. so that I can exonerate the storage. People often ask me, this, the disks are slow. It's causing our application to be slow. And I can run this and trace at the file system level and exonerate the storage subsystem and say, no, the disks aren't slow. You're not getting any slow latency at the file system level. If you run IOSTAT and you see the disks are busy, it's because they're doing write back flushing and they're doing read ahead, but you're not suffering that as the application. And I can do histograms. That's my TCP life. DNS latency, because I can instrument user level. Run queue latency, I demoed. Oh, I demoed some trace, which is a multi-tool. And another multi-tool is argdisk, where I can come up with an arbitrary invocation, and then it can do a histogram. Visualizations. So that's at the command line, poking around, and I like poking around at the command line, a lot of people will use BPF from GUIs. They may not even know it's BPF. Recently at Netflix, I've been working on Vector, so you click a button and you get a heat map or an off-CPU flame graph, and that's BPF behind the scenes. A visualization that's well-suited for BPF is the heat map, and Alexi added an example to this in Linux under samples BPF a while ago. And so here on the y-axis is the passage of time, and on the x-axis is latency. I first did latency heat maps at Sun many years ago, and we put them in a product. They were very, very useful. They solved lots of issues. Because you get to see, you get to see outliers, you get to identify multimodal latency, and you also get to identify variance over time. Another visualization we're likely to use a lot with BPF is, well, I am using a lot, is flame graphs. <laughs> Since Linux 4.8 and 4.9, they added stack trace support and sampling support. So I can sample unique stack traces in the kernel and use the stack trace as a unique key, and only frequency count occurrences of that stack trace. Instead of the perf events way of dumping them all out to the file system and post processing. With off CPU, I can trace scheduler functions. So I can look at latency when you're blocked off CPU and grab the stack trace to see why. Off-CPU analysis, in some ways, is the holy grail of performance engineering. Since we're pretty good at on-CPU analysis, so if you're in kernel space or user space, we can just use a profiler. We can use PMCs to see if you're doing stall cycles or whatnot. That's, there's a lot of tools at our disposal. But once you block and go off-CPU, things get harder. But BPF should make this easy if I can trace when you block and when you start again. The problem is, when you look at a lot of the block stacks, they aren't self-explanatory. Here's a block stack for gzip. It's blocked on pipe read, but we don't know what's on the other end of that pipe. So it's not terribly helpful. We can instrument wake-up, wake-ups as well, since we, I can just instrument the kernel when it calls a wake-up from one task to another. And so here's a wake-up showing that gzip at the top was woken up by tar, and I've got the stack trace in the middle. That's because tar was piped into gzip. Now, something special I can do with BPF is I can merge those two stack traces in kernel. And so it's the first time I've been able to do this in any tracing tool. And it's because the way BPF does a, a get stack ID, it gives me a numerical identifier for a stack trace. And then I can, I can store two of them together in a struct. 
or I can store many of them, I can store a whole chain of them. So now in the kernel, I can paste together this waker stack woke up this block stack. And I can really understand the latency of when we block and go off CPU and we're waiting on a, a pipe or a lock or some event and then some other thread wakes us up. We can start to stitch together that flow and visualize it. Very, very useful. But be a bit careful about overheads because we are tracing scheduler functions and they can be frequent. We can go further and go all the way to metal and trace all the wake-up stacks. So that's something experimental that I'm still working on with eBPF. Chain graphs. In the future, we're still improving BCC as a front end. And some things have been getting better recently. And Paul's here, and that was improving the unnecessary BPF Pro breeds. So thanks for that. Um, and th that's how some of these tools actually got a, a little bit nicer. Higher level language, as I mentioned, Ply is one, and that was developed for a while, although it seems to have stalled for a bit. Ply lets us do these, these powerful one-liners. There's doing a histogram where I'm sort, saving a timestamp and then turning it into a power of two histogram. BPF trace is another one. It's been more recently worked on and updated. And so again, I can do these very powerful one-liners, kprobe sysopen, printf, this is the string. And again, I can come up with powerful histograms and so on. The BPF trace currently lacks the ability to dereference lots of kernel functions, like I was demonstrating earlier. But that's just something we need to add. We will add more tools. There's quite a lot so far for BCC. And I showed heat maps and flame graphs, but given such a rich quantity of data, we will probably come up with new visualizations as well. If you use BPF and BCC or your own front end, please share case studies about it. it, it is, these advanced tracing tools, it's difficult for people to get their head around it and understand what do I do with this? So I've already used these to solve lots of issues at Netflix. I need to write them up and put them on a blog somewhere and share them and hopefully you can do that as well. So that's what I had in the slides. The takeaways are to understand the tracing components so for the new stuff, it's eBPF is the back end and BCC is the front end. And if you're on 4.9, you get to use all the great observability features. And hopefully you can contribute as well, since it's an it's ex exciting area to work in. I will publish the slides. I have links and references. And that's my talk. And we'll start with some questions. Let's find the box. Where's the throwing box? Yeah, so, um, I mean, these are obviously really great tools, but you can't use them on, on the machines that actually generate all that massive amount of traffic because those run free, free BSD. So why? <laughs> well, the uh, free BSD ones, we have a tracing tool called Dtrace, which we can use in a similar way. But, I mean, it, it was just an example, but we do have massive amounts of traffic in the cloud as well. And so I do care about lowering the overhead down to... Zero. It, it's just the, this notion of like tracing send receive is acceptable is is one that is, is is one I don't agree with and something that we should try and avoid as much as possible. Other questions over there. Yeah. We are currently using SX Snoop for debugging Yocto uh, execution paths. And the problem we are having is that the argument list is huge. Uh, is there any easy way to fix it? So we can show argument list of 3,000 bytes or? 3,000 bytes? Yeah. Minus minus is root equal minus. <laughs> you know, I arbitrarily limited it. I bet I arbitrarily limited. Max arg is 20. Yeah, I, I hacked that one and. and, and <laughs> Did that, you modify that and it didn't, still didn't work? Yeah, it, it crashes somehow. It crashes? Yeah. That, that, that's normal? Yeah, uh, Yeah, this is my own. This is my dirty stuff. You know, like. <laughs> And like, just as a subtle clue with that no one got that it's dirty, I labeled it with Roman numerals on the right. So there's like level 10 and level 20 of the unrolled loop. So I could track how many I was adding. Yeah, there's some dirty stuff in here. 
but like we should make this better. And so some work that's been happening is to do strings in maps, because at the moment this is passing strings through the BPF stack, and the BPF stack itself is limited to like, uh, what's it, 40, 4096 bytes, and we can't, or 512 bytes, and we can't increase that without changing a fixed kernel uh, pound define. And so the way around that is to put strings into BPF maps, which are unlimited, and then drag them out. So can this be fixed? Yes. I, as far as I know, the string stuff got into the maps. I just haven't done the work yet, but if someone else wants to do the work, please do. I believe this should be fixable. And you can get, probably get rid of this unrolled loop. Depends, you still have to walk through each of the arguments. As part of BPF um, being production safe, it does not allow loops. It does not allow backwards branches. That's why sometimes you have to unroll loops. Dirty as it is. You know, I should do a pound of fines to make that prettier, but anyway. So yeah, it, I think it's fixable. It's using the string maps. Yes. Um, so last I knew there's this, this um, C clang front end, there's no actual documentation. Has that changed? There's some examples in the kernel source tree, but there's no documentation saying what you can and can't do with this subset of C. Has that changed? Uh, I've not seen a good document on it, but you'll feel free to write a document yeah, on it. It yeah, sounds yeah. like you're figuring this stuff out. Alexei tried to get me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Now I'm getting you to try and do that. Uh, yeah, it's, th there are parts of this that aren't documented. This is why I went to town and wrote lots of examples. They're not just useful, but they're also examples of using this stuff because you can then copy and paste from my examples and build up your tools. So it, it, at least we have examples now. When I started, there was very little. So, but it needs to get better, so we still need more documentation. In BCC, there is a reference guide in the docs directory, so you can, so under docs, there's a reference guide for that. That's for BCC, I'm not sure I, I went into much of Clang LLVM stuff. Okay, I guess we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll switch over. Who's next? No more questions? Everyone's tied up lunch. <laughs> well, Amaran, you can ask me questions later, and that's my talk. Thank you very much.